quite literally in the break, I just learned a new word. Go on. Uh, so I, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, but here it comes. Uh, Kalsarikarnit. Okay. Kalsarikarnit is the Finnish concept of drinking at home alone in your underwear. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Yeah. I'm assuming the only acceptable drink to fulfill this concept is the uh, liqueur that we had in one of the last episodes of our podcast, which translated to drink to forget. Yes. Um, which is a, a nice, it, well, let's be honest, it's what we're all doing in life. But uh, that, was also, the, that was also European as well, wasn't it? Something about... It was, it was some, German. German, yeah. So something about Central European um, or Continental European uh, liqueurs or language yeah. around drinking centers around drinking in embarrassing circumstances i presume well i, I just well how what is embarrassing about a man enjoying a nice cold beer in his pants at home um by himself entirely entirely by himself well no, nothing really but i never thought that he needed one specific word to describe it but this is slightly more interesting from the article which i read it in it said the word was included in a description of country themed emojis by Finland's Ministry for Foreign Affairs. So not only does that a word I've learned, but I've learned that in Finland there's an emoji for it. <laughs> That's going to be a thing where uh, future historians... You know how uh, now historians uh, historians of language will look at like the first recorded usage of a particular word? Um, mm. And it's, it's often said that you know Shakespeare invented X hundred of number, number of words, which is you know probably mostly true but slightly misleading because they are the first um first recorded usage and the context in which they use makes it clear that they're already kind of in use at the yeah, time yeah if they were the first time they used them yeah so it's future historians are going to look back on that web page somebody would have like you know said it on stage and then suddenly you'd lean to the mate in the audience and gone the fuck you just say <laughs> like he's also, as green as he is cabbage looking <laughs> Okay. Also, during the break, um, I was <clears throat> looking at the Wikipedia page for Mary Toft, the rabbit birthing woman from a few moments ago. Yes. And I learned that before she graduated to, to fraudulently giving birth to live rabbits, she got her start, if you like, her, her opening act for, 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 this, for this little gig was giving birth to just parts of animals. Yeah. I honestly thought you were going to say before she graduated Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she sounds like the kind of person who would really fit in well in the uh, in the yeah, uh, say, who, storied who would, halls of Oxford who University. Would, who would even let her pass clearing? What is going on here? <laughs> just um, goes, she lists it under like uh, uh, extracurricular activities on her on her UCAS form. Yeah, before she graduated the University of Huddersfield, uh, <laughs> she was wait, polytechnic. Um, Yes, so that's that's what we learned during the break. That's mm, and part, jingle of, too. Apparently, part of what gave it away was the fact that the people animal, don't give birth to rabbits. Well, okay, that too. But part of what gave it away in the you know in the ignorant uh, uh, minds of the people who were doing the investigating mm. and thought this was worth investigating in the first place was the fact that the animal parts were clearly cut up with a saw. <laughs> It's like CSI. <laughs> yeah. what, what, what year is this? 1650 or something? <laughs> Seven, uh, early 1700s. Early 1700s. Gil Grissom's like, there's, there's tool marks on this rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't happen with natural births. There's some, there's some guy in the background continuously putting on and taking off his sunglasses. So what we will be talking about on this section of the podcast is... Nick, you recently went to a convention where you were basically the sole representative of the comic book uh, publishing company that you write for. Yes. Um, and obviously, uh, you've been to conventions just as a consumer before, and you've been to conventions as an artist before. Um, what would what are the sort of the main differences between between those two? Uh, are there any sort of ways where they overlap in a weird way? Both are very tiring. <laughs> Fair enough. So it's been degree a, of physical tiredness. A lot of is a degree of physical tiredness does not go away. You think just because you have a chair, but like you spend most of your time stood up anyway. So what the fuck? But 
You spend far less money as a <laughs> as a guest. Yes, I'm sure you yeah, do. If, if you pay for a ticket and have to wander around buying things, you tend to spend far more money. I'd like to point out that this is this is comic book conventions. Oh sure, yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm not like you know, I'm not putting my fur suit on and going you know, <laughs> to go meet a bunch of people who are all into yiffing. You know, I, I, yeah, I yeah. Um, how appropriate that topic of conversation is, given Mary Toft. Um, Did I actually tell you that when I I, I went out because it was in Sheffield. It was Sheffield Robot Con. It was very good. It was very comic book orientated. So a lot of good creators there, and the, the crowd were very up for comics and spending money and things like that, which is always sure. good. I, so it may sound very mercenary, but you know, you want a crowd that is both friendly, but also willing to part with their money, because you can have conventions where people are like just the greatest people on earth, but then you realize you've just wasted a ton of money uh, <laughs> by having to pay for it train ticket to get there and stuff but um yes yeah, so it was really really good but then we were walking to taco bell afterwards because if you're gonna go to sheffield you're gonna go to taco bell because there were very few of them in england sure yeah and i'm walking my way there and there were literal furries in the street <laughs> a furry by the way if anybody doesn't know because if we have to know this information then you have to know this information yeah as yeah, well. yeah yeah, yeah. Furry... i, I want to share my curse with the world <laughs> a furry is somebody who recreationally enjoys dressing up as a theme park mascot and yeah, then yeah. and then I don't know maybe sort of being fucked in the theme park mas- mascot costume yeah, is sort yeah, of optional yeah. but you know that's it's, I think it's, it's usually a sexual it. thing it's to do it's to do with sexual gratification it is a, a, a sexy sexy thing that people do but the thing is they don't just dress up as like you know an animal because I can I can see it's something I do and it's an open world Sure. Um, but like dressing up as Crash Bandicoot to get your rocks off, less so. <laughs> but uh, so we were, I was walking along and I was like, what is that to do with the convention? Did they get barred from entry? And the guy I was with was like, no, they just do it. They just turn up on a Saturday in the center of Sheffield and just hang out in their fursuits. And I'm like, what oh my a God. strange cosmopolitan you brought me to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I was going to make a point about conventions and say that I've never been to one myself, but they have always struck me as sort of giant niche shopping centers that you have to pay to get into. Yes. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the whole thing about... It's interesting you mentioned about, like, furries just out there in the open because mm. um, because I was walking around my uh, home city recently and I saw, uh, I saw a guy walking around wearing a collar and a foxtail yes and, like i volunteer for the rspca right and i'm mostly vegetarian i really you know i animal welfare and animal rights are, are something very important to me mm-hmm. but i saw that boy and i just thought i am now in favor of fox hunting <laughs> you know <laughs> I, I i am now done a complete uh pinwheel 180 degree you turn immediately and all it's... joined you immediately joined the countryside alliance <laughs> yeah, and exactly. bought a red jacket <laughs> and all it all, all it took was 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 one person wearing a fox that i mean I, i'd like to point out the fox tail wasn't like attached to like an a butt plug or anything it was just like attached to his jeans but i'm like that's that's still pretty bad i mean come on <laughs> I'm gonna li- I'm gonna listen back on this. I'm gonna listen back to this podcast in like ten years' time. I'll be like, God, I was such a bigot. <laughs> no, I've, I I find it very hard. They're like I I like to be open-minded for people's um sort of sexual proclivity, but I sort of just want to. <laughs> actually, I did that out for I did that completely out. <laughs> yes, yes, I think is beating up a furry a hate crime? Yes, probably. Um, <laughs> Anyway, back to conventions. Yeah, they basically conventions are just big supermarkets, but sure. ones where you can get stuff signed. So I, I don't know because there are so many different sorts of people and they have different sorts of enjoyment from conventions. So there are ones who will literally bring things they already own to have them signed by creators they like. Yeah, sure. I, I completely get the yeah. appeal of that. I mean, you know, I've been to uh, meet and greets with bands that I've really admired, and you know, I've got some, you know tapes and CDs and vinyls and stuff which are mm. signed by those artists. That much I can get behind. What, like that, what, I, I, understand. what I don't kind of get is that how can this be so popular in a field where most people have social anxiety? 
Yes, that's another weird contradiction, mm, isn't it? Yeah, yeah because, because I, I, I have had, I've queued up and had things signed and made a very awkward conversation with creators I admire and just sweat profusely in the queue, got there, babbled at them, looked a bit like I was um, a, a psychotic and then left and then gone, what a great day out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because to, I don't want to overgeneralize, but, you know, if you're into this kind of niche stuff, this isn't a field which generally attracts lots of extra. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say it out loud and proud. Nerds are kind of nerdy. <laughs> like it's, it's uh, different thoughts and different strokes and different folks. But you know, like nerds are kind of nerdy. They're like we, we are our people, people especially. Quite a lot of us got involved in it because it was something that we could enjoy. You know, like it's something we discovered to deal with other things. You know. Yeah, so excuse me a second ago for being all PC and like tiptoeing around using the phrase nerds are pretty nerdy. Well, it's, it's, it's true. And I think that I think for me, I follow a lot of people in the comic book industry on Twitter, as you'd imagine. Hmm. And we, they all talk quite openly about how, how quite a lot of them have anxiety, how a lot of them have depression, how a lot of them have issues talking to people, how we all want a nice safe space to enjoy our lives in, and uh, how we want to sort of promote conversation about these things. And Do, do you think there's the, something um, about uh, tabletop gaming or um, comic books or any of the other things that you see at conventions, is there something about those hobbies that just speaks to and attracts a certain kind of introvert? I or is it, it, is, it, it, is it just that introverts generally coalesce around each other and it just happens to be around this one particular thing? Well, I think that like reading and reading comic books, reading books, reading fantasy books, they are things you can do by yourself. You know, if you are socially awkward, you don't want to speak to people, you don't have to. Sure. You know, and there is a huge amount of escapism. It's kind of like a soap opera is a lot. A lot of comic books are like a soap opera, like. You know, you just buy it week in, week out. Some great long story. You build up relationships with the characters. Sure. And and somebody quite rightly pointed out that like um, Captain America was invented by two Jewish men who wanted to demonstrate how Hitler needed a good punch in the face. You know, it, it's it sort of speaks to uh, uh, people who need to be represented who aren't necessarily represented in the wider mainstream. So maybe that's one of the reasons why people who read book, comic books have a tendency to be a bit more socially awkward. Maybe the other reason is that all these things are quite, you know, fantasy is fantasy, isn't it? You know? Yeah. If you're Dungeons and Dragons thing, you can be more outgoing. You can role play a character and then have the safety of going home and being yourself at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I have a sort of a pet theory about um, sort of social anxiety and not so much fantasy tabletop gaming, but sort of fantasy... Uh, novels, I suppose, um, in that I think it, it it's speaks to something within the person who is who is very uh, anxious because even though in the context of these fantasy novels, the world in question might be huge and sprawling and have fifty different races of people or races of creatures and they're all at war with each other and it's all these complicated political systems and, and family dynamics and all that sort of stuff, but at least everything makes sense. Mm. You, you, the, the fantasy novel is a world where everything makes sense and everything it, it, is eventually just, tied together. There is a rules and constructs that you can know and understand that you might not necessarily about the real world. Yeah, exactly. And there's something like, very comforting, I think, in in the knowledge that, yeah, okay, this is huge and sprawling and epic, but everything, not that, not necessarily that everything will come out right in the end, but, you know, everything eventually makes sense. Everything mm. goes into its right place. And the thing is, that it's if, if I think that, you know, maybe the other thing is that people don't get into comic books because they are socially awkward, but they get into comic books as a result of wanting to meet people who they know are sort of socially awkward, if you know what I mean. You know, you just... You get involved in a community that you want to be a part of because you want to meet people who won't judge you for being who you are. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, not, not like two douchebags on a podcast judging you <laughs> for wearing a tail as you walk through Peterborough High Street. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible to talk about this kind of thing without talking about the industry as a whole. But we have this conversation in the week that uh, the vice president of Marvel. Uh, he he said in an interview that uh, the reason that Marvel is going through a sales slump at the moment is because. Fans didn't real real comic book fans 
didn't want diversity in their comic books. Oh, didn't he have to walk back that statement oh, like half massively. an hour later? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was like, whoa, there, I realize I've just said something stupid and won't stand by my convictions like, a, you know, every right winger doesn't. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, though, he, um, but the thing is, he's wrong. And to, first of all, to call all the readership racist um, for your poor sales slump is a bit out there. Uh, but because it is that, isn't it? it's like saying, well, they're not reading it because they're racist, or mm. they're not reading because they're sexist. When in actuality, they're not reading it because it's not that good anymore. But um, you know, they've got titles like Squirrel Girl and Ms. Marvel and sure. Captain Marvel that are all selling really well. But then you know, like nobody's buying Captain America because you made him a Nazi for three episodes. Yes, that's true. That was you know, one of so- the more regrettable decisions of uh, of the. One of the Marvel world shakeups, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, so like you know, because wasn't the storyline that he was secretly a Hydra agent all along? Yes. Which really kind of, <laughs> well, it's it's useless to look for consistency in these world uh, world shakeup events, well, but no, that can, really does cons- seem to contradict more than the average considering, one. Considering considering especially that he was like, it's not made up, it's not fake, he's not a clone. Yeah, we're doing this. This is a bold story decision. The next episode, like, yep, he was made up. It was a clone. <laughs> it was some reality warping. Yeah. Comic books, though, are weird. I'm going to say this over and over again. But, like, it's, it's a business. But it's a business that is built around selling us, trying to sell something that has primarily been sold to a very small amount of people to a mass market now. Sure, yeah. And also, you've got to think that, uh, Mar- I mean, especially Marvel, because they seem to be ha- they're the ones that are having the most success with it at the moment. But... Their major concern, I suppose, um, in in terms of like the day to day managing of their business, isn't mm. really comic books. You know, there are there not are anymore. Film- no, no. I mean, they're 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 a film studio. Um, they have um, you know all the merchandise for their characters to manage. Um, they're an arm of the Disney Corporation now, mm-hmm. um, and they sort of do comic books on the side. And most of a lot of their output seems to be kind of test kitchens, I suppose, for ideas that will later end up in the films. It's such a weird contradictory scenario in that everybody in the world knows who Captain America and Iron Man is, but nobody is buying comics featuring those characters, Yeah. at at least largely, because, you know, unless you live in in a a decent-sized city, there isn't a shop that you can go to to buy them. And now some chat about music in films. I just think that some of the films that have engaged me the best have had the best uh, music involved in it. So, like, you look at Mad Max Fury Road, part of the energy of that movie is the absolutely insane score to it. Yes. And, you know, had they just used, like, you know, corn over the top, <laughs> probably wouldn't have been so hot. I knew you were going to say corn. <laughs> yeah, I was uh... trying to think of a... I don't think of the name of a Papa Roach song, but nope. Oh, uh, yeah, last, last Resort would have been a perfectly terrible choice for, the, for, for some for, for parts of that film. Oh, no, somebody should reshoot the trailer with that point. <laughs> I'll, I want to do, do it. You know do what? You remember, I, do you remember that when, like, films used to have a song in the film and, like, you'd have, like, a, I don't know, like, Breaking Benjamin would do a song that'd be featured in Spider-Man 2 yes. and then... They have the video, and the video have like scenes of from the film in. Yeah, don't do that so much anymore, do we? No, no. The last one I can really remember um, because I really like this band was um, Taking Back Sunday had a song on the Fantastic Four soundtrack. Um, that was the Fantastic Four, which had Chris Evans and Jessica Alba. Yeah, yeah, the the, uh, the original and best, but like <laughs> best of a bad bunch. Like it's a bad movie, but it's the best Fantastic Four movie. Yeah, it's obviously uh, the James Bond ones do it still, and that makes oh sense. yeah, well James Bond is the is, is, but is they don't the, they don't the count. No, that doesn't really count. Although I do kind of like that in every Bond theme, uh, in every Bond song, um, they always get the Bond melody in there, and sometimes it works oh. itself in really organically, and then sometimes it's just like oh, we need to have this in there now. Vice versa, like they will have a sort of reprise version of it played purely instrumental during the movie. 
Mm, sure. And that's so the lowest, nice that's always nice as well, because they're actually incorporating the theme song into the actual song itself. Mm, and again, and, that's, another, that's another advantage, isn't it, of using original music, because then you can, and, you are free to cut it up and use the melodies in different places rather than just putting, you know, um, freak on a leash dot mp3 um, <laughs> over the opening <laughs> over the opening credits my, of your my, film. My, my favorite James Bond film is On a Magic Secret Service. Yeah. And that actually is one of the very few ones to actually use a song in it that isn't like the title theme tune, but is a song. So they, they play uh, Louis Armstrong doing all the time in the world. Mm. And that's not the Bond theme. The theme that plays over the um, credits, are, like the opening titles of On the Magic Secret Service, is the song On the Magic Secret Service, which is the dun, 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 dun. And, you know, it plays, it's good. And it's got the sort of sexist imagery that all Bond films have of like a naked woman on the a Britannia gun. crest, whatever. Exactly. Phallic <laughs> ob- naked woman, phallic object. Boom, 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 you know. But then it plays Louis Armstrong half of the film in a really nice scene, and it really, really works. But um, one of the strengths of Bonds, most definitely, is the music to it and the way that they incorporate the theme tune into the song. Yeah, that's one thing you can always count on with Bond, isn't it? Like, however (laughs) inconsistent the the uh, the storylines and the acting and the direction are, and they often are very inconsistent. At At the very least, the music is always kind of woven into into the fabric yeah. of the film in, in, yeah. a, in a way which is sort of a bit of a mixed metaphor here but it kind of papers over the cracks you know <laughs> woven into the paper yeah all right thank you nick <laughs> uh i was trying to come up with a with a um with a uh uh giving birth to rabbits metaphor to finish that bit of, like, <laughs> i couldn't i couldn't, couldn't think of it it's what what you know do you know what the music really does in james one it really just uh Paint the prophecy on the egg of the chicken. It really just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Yeah. But do you know what? Go to on. me, the music in James Bond films is really just the saw marks and the bone <laughs> of an amputated rabbit leg that slid out of a woman. Oh, you are... Two, two from two there, Nick. And <laughs> I think on on that on that wildly disgusting note, <laughs> I would like to say thank you to the one person who is still listening. <laughs> oh God, if you've made it made it six deep, well done to you. Indeed, thank you so much. This has been episode six of uh, Expert Commander. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, I have been you. Christopher Armour. I continue to be Nick Gonzo. And we will see you next week. Thank you and good night. Mm. 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 Mm.